Section three, um, popular culture, not merely populism. Okay. In an article published in 1984, I again needed to clarify the difference between A, the people, Pueblo, and the popular sector, Lo Popular. Okay, so now he's introducing this concept of the Pueblo, not Lo Popular. Uh, so, but, he, oh, but he's grouping those together as one thing. And then B, populism, okay, which has taken various forms from Thatcherite populism. Margaret Thatcher was the Prime Minister of, of uh, Britain in the 1980s and was like uh, political buddies with Ronald Reagan and union busting and saying there is no society, everyone's on their own, buck up, and uh, you know, uh, totally driving people out of, out of their traditional union jobs and uh, having people that otherwise would be in public housing buy their own homes and then go into foreclosure, uh, things like this. So, so you have Thatcherite populism in the United Kingdom, um, as suggested by Ernesto Lacau, and studied in Birmingham by Richard Hall through the contemporary incarnation of fundamentalism in the Muslim world, a fundamentalism which is equally present, for example, in the North American Christian sectarianism of George W. Bush. Okay, so this is the younger George W. Bush that he's referring to. There is a Christian fundamentalism alive and well in the United States that moves in this, um, this populist uh, direction, which can be very reactionary. And I should mention in relationship to Thatcher, okay, Reagan was, was uh, Thatcher's uh, political buddy, uh, you know, across the Atlantic. And, um, and it, you know, it should be mentioned that Reagan is like the, the model of, um, you know, of a, of a populist leader uh, like Donald Trump. So they're, they're not entirely, you know, on different pages. Donald Trump is very much in the model of Ronald Reagan. Um, and, uh, and, and something that most students don't realize, you know, because you weren't alive and uh, most of us, and, um, and, and this is obscured in popular culture, is that baby boomers who were part of the 1968 revolution voted for Reagan, who was um, was very much like a petty bourgeois socialist in the way that Marx and Engels describe it in the Communist Manifesto. Uh, that was a reactionary, <clears throat> um, but, but not just petty bourgeois exactly the way that they described. That was part of the rhetoric. But in, in actual fact, it was uh, just a, an intensification of bourgeois exploitation of, of Wall Street of the working class. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, what I want to be clear about is that the same kids in 1968 that, that uh, mourned the death of R Robert Kennedy, that's JFK's younger brother, who was assassinated in 1968, and um, who maybe weren't as racist as most people in the United States and actually mourned the death of Martin Luther King Jr. On average, those same kids that were smoking bongs in their uh, VW, bug, VW bus, right, in this kind of stereotypical kind of way and were part of the flower power and, and uh, the free love movement in 1968, the summer of love in 1967 and into psychedelics and dropping LSD and, you know, doing crank and all this kind of stuff. Uh, that same group in general, not every specific individual, but as a, a cohort, as a sociological um, subgroup 
uh, within American society, they en masse voted for Ronald Reagan. The same people, I mean, many of the same people. And, um, and, and uh, you know, by 1984, they had traded in their VW bus for a BMW. And in sm instead of smoking a bong, they're snorting cocaine off the dashboard of their BMW or some other parts unknown. These, you know, and by and large, these are the same people. Um, and, and so this, so this problem of low popular, you know, what's hip and cool going in weird directions is very much exemplified by that. You have the hippies become the yuppies. And it's not, the yuppies and the hippies are the same people. They're all baby boomers. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, uh, so, so, you know, I think that's indicative of this problem of populism and, and popular culture being identified with, <clears throat> with a real uh, political consciousness, you know, and something that we have to be aware of in, in the face of the ecological cataclysm, just because somebody talks in green language doesn't mean they're actually uh, constructively working to save the ecology. Uh, many, many people who talk in the language of environmentalism are actually operating consciously or unconsciously, but in many cases consciously, to undermine the ecology and to serve the interest of transnational corporations and things like this, to serve the bourgeois element, uh, the 1% Wall Street, uh, rather than actually saving the ecology. They put on the show of saving the ecology so that the mega machine and Scheidler's terminology can continue forward in its destructive path. So let's, let's be clear about that and why this is so important, right? <clears throat> and then of course we can move into fundamentalism and you know we see in today in today's headlines i don't know if all of us are aware of it but uh, the 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 guaranteed right to an abortion is under threat right now in the supreme court the supreme court is considering whether to overturn roe v wade um, the landmark case that that made it legal to have abortions uh, in the united states um, so we have these fundamentalist elements operating in the highest levels of power in Washington. And um, so, you know, the, this, this discussion that, that Dussel is unfolding here is very relevant to our time at so many different levels. And of course, January 6th was a big wake up call. Okay. Uh, in that article from 1984, we divided the material in four sections. In the first section, we reconstructed our position since the 1960s, showing the need to overcome the limitations of reductivism, of ahistorical revolutionaries, or of the liberal histories of Hispanic conservatives or indignistas. Um, and we reconstructed Latin American cultural history within the framework of world history from Asia or Amerindian component, uh, the Asian Afro-European proto-history through Hispanic uh, Christianity, colonial Christianity, though post-colonial and neo-colonial dependent uh, or through post-colonial and neo-colonial dependent Latin American culture. The whole project ended with a project for a popular post-capitalist culture. Okay, a popular post-capitalist culture. So this is uh, interesting. He's talking about post-capitalism, which is a Marxian idea that capitalism is coming to an end uh, and, and that there's something beyond capitalism, but also popular. 
And then this popular, this word popular is problematic. Okay, he says, quoting, when we were in the mountains, wrote Thomas Borges about the Campesinos, and we heard them speak with their pure, clean hearts, with a simple and poetic language, we understood how much talent had been lost by the neo-colonial elites throughout the centuries. So here's where he's bringing in indigenous cultural resources, uh, that the indigenous cultures are a spiritual re resource, an intellectual, uh, philosophical resource uh, that could transform history and move beyond capitalism uh, by embracing the popular, by embracing the people. This required a new point of departure for the description of culture as such, the subject of the second section. Through a careful and archaeological reading, uh, rereading of Marx from his early works in 1835 to those of 1882, we showed that all culture is a mode or a system of types of work. It is no coincidence that agriculture means in a strict sense work of the earth since the etymological root of culture comes from the Latin cultus in the sense of sacred consecration. Okay, so here we see a very Marxian bent to uh, Dussel's thinking. Both material poetics, uh, the physical fruits of labor, so material po poetics means making in, in this uh, uh, connection to Greek in this case, uh, physical fruits of labor, and mythical poetics, symbolic creation, uh, are forms of cultural production, putting the subjective, or better yet, the intersubjective and communal outside objectively. So production, taking something from inside of you and putting it out into the world. Um, <clears throat> In this way, we recu uh, recuperated the economic without falling into economism. Okay, so he's trying to recuperate Marxism and not be overly uh, doctrinaire in adhering to Marxism, to glean uh, something from Marxism, uh, but not just be slavishly committed to everything that Marxists believe, or that Marx himself believed, or whatever. Okay. In the third section, and, and then he gets out of this, the idea of culture being a product of production. So this is, and, and this had already been touched upon, especially by uh, a couple of philosophers named Ardeno and Horkheimer. Um, and so this is not entirely original, but, but um, a detailed analysis of Marx to, to think about cultural production uh, is something that was definitely uh, unique at the time. In a third section, we analyze the various newly fractured moments of a post-culturalist or post-Spengarian understanding of cultural experience. Bourgeois culture, that's A below, was studied in its abstract relation to proletarian culture, uh, B. And the culture of the core countries was analyzed in relation to the culture of the peripheral cu cultures in, in the order of the global world system the order, the systematic structure of the world system. Okay, so let's take a look here. So we have bourgeois culture, we have proletarian culture. Okay, this is the, this division here is the division we find in the Communist Manifesto. But then, uh, uh, Dussel wants to analyze this in unique and different ways, uh, in, in, a, in, in a renovated sort of way, and he gets these other categories. Okay. Moreover, multi uh, multinational cultural cultural imperialism 
Okay, now he's talking about cultural imperialism. Uh, C was described in relation to the mass or alienated culture, D, which was globalized. Okay, so we have C versus D. We have C, multinational cult cultural culture, and we have mass culture. Okay, so this, so this diagram is kind of weird, and he has all these diagrams in this book, which some of the diagrams is like, I, I think you would have to be in one of his lectures to really understand the way the diagram works, but this is my interpretation, is in, in, uh, in the Communist Manifesto, we have A versus B. We have bourgeois culture versus proletarian culture. And of course, in the Communist Manifesto, that's conceived entirely in political economic terms. But now, Dussel is going to think about it in cultural terms, especially considering the category of popular culture, which comes out of the people all the way down to the root of the indigenous people. Um, but then within bourgeois culture, we have multinational culture. This is like what we're studying in this course. You know, the overall objective is to kind of, from a, from a dogmatic, uh, you know, cultural programming sort of way. We're trying to teach students multiculturalism. For those of us who are concerned about, uh, you know, critical race theory, um, I'm not quite sure what that means. I've never studied critical race theory, but the hysteria on, uh, from reactionaries like on Fox News about, about uh, critical race theory is a, a reaction against what has been part of like community college education for decades and decades is to try to instill in students a, a sense of multiculturalism that their other cultures exist and should be treated with respect uh, you know, this is kind of what the intention of this course is. Yes, we are trying to teach you that other cultures exist, that they are real, because there are people who would just say, well, they're not cultures, like Latin American culture, Mexican culture, not a real thing. Um, you know, and, and, and that could be, you know, turned in all sorts of different ways. Uh, but, you know, we want to, in, inculcate to instill in you the idea that other cultures exist, that there's a lot of them that you don't know about, and that they have things that are valuable that are even missing from United States culture. You know, this is the idea of multiculturalism. Now, Dussel identifies this as part of bourgeois culture, right? This, this uh, and, and of course, on Fox News, as much as they um, rail against critical race theory, the older terminology was uh, globalist. This is the alt-right terminology of like QAnon and, um, and Steve Bannon and uh, Breitbart um, editorials is, you know, the globalists, the, the people who think that there's a whole world of cultures out there and that we're all integrated in some way. Um, <clears throat> uh, this multinational culture, a global culture, this is part of bourgeois culture. Uh, from Dussel's perspective, he's like, yes, this is part of the liberal elites culture. And now liberal elites is liberal bourgeois elites which is like the Democratic Party. Yes, <laughs> multiculturalism is, is part of their agenda. Uh, but Dussel wants to mark this off, multinational culturalism or globalism, or, or I don't know that critical race theory is really, like I don't know that that's useful as a category. But globalism, I, I, when Steve Bannon talks, I know what he's talking about. Um, and I understand what he means by globalism. And it seems to be a legitimate uh, category. Okay. Um, but um, but uh, this multiculturalism versus mass culture, okay, which still exists within bourgeois culture, uh, but mass culture is more rooted in in the people, you know, in the masses of people, okay. 
um, and he calls it mass or alienated culture. Okay, so now he's reintroducing alienation. So notice that when he said he studied Marx, um, he went back to 1835. He went back to the early writings of Marx all the way through the Feuerbachian period in which alienation was conceived in this existential angst kind of way. Remember that I made a big deal when I talked about the schematic introduction to Marxist political ecology, is that alienation in, the, in capital, when Marx talks about alienation of labor in capital, he's talking about the expropriation of labor by the capitalists, you know, appropriating the labor and alienating the labor of, of the worker. Uh, in a political, economic, concrete way. But earlier, Marx had ruminated on alienation in a Feuerbachian way, in which uh, Feuerbach says that, you know, God is a projection of our, our, our good things, our best things, and we alienate from our own human nature the best things and put it in God, and then feel lesser than God because we've, we've, we've idealized this in a, in a foreign entity. But for Feuerbach, this is purely a fantasy, but points to something deeply rooted in humanity. Dussel is reintroducing alienation um, in some way here, but now in terms of culture, that there is a culture of alienation. Multinational culture pretends to integrate all cultures into one globalized community but many people on the periphery of the empire, the bourgeois North American empire, uh, don't see themselves in that multiculturalism, right? And so this is a very central problem of this course that we're taking right now. You know, what are we, what are we trying to instill? How, how, you know, can we just indoctrinate people into this global, you know, Dussel's call, calling attention to this as, as being problematic. Um, just, you know, presenting some wishy-washy liberal bourgeois notion of multiculturalism uh, doesn't really help with the, 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 the dialogue, the intercultural dialogues uh, that go on all over around the world, south, south, north, south, etc. cetera, um, because there's a whole mass culture of alienated culture. The, the culture in which most people live is a culture that, that can't even comprehend this multiculturalism, let's call it BS, right? And this is the leverage that someone like Steve Bannon has when he talks about globalism, is that there is a fundamental problem with a wishy-washy, uh, non-thoroughgoing multiculturalism. And, and that's exactly what we want to get at uh, for this course, right? <clears throat> we don't merely want to be spouting some kind of pie-in-the-sky utopian multiculturalism. I have to really think about the people who are, who were supposed to be acknowledging and respecting, uh, those people are in many ways totally disrespected by multiculturalism. Okay. Um, and then we have uh, national or populist culture as integrated with the culture of the enlightened elite, F. Okay, so E and F, that we have national culture and enlightened culture. And of course, there is some connection here vertically between multiculturalism and enlightened culture. You know, this is all very bourgeois, elite, liberal kind of thinking. But then off to the right, there's this nationalism that kind of gets incorporated into enlightened uh, culture. You know, we see this like with neoconservatism and, and, and like with um, the Reagan phenomenon, where you have 
uh, hippies being integrated into a nationalistic uh, enlightened culture, but in a kind of um, almost unconscious kind of way. And of course, uh, enlightened culture here would be like bourgeois liberalism, which, which is, is always distancing itself from nationalism, like in, in the Democratic Party. You know, they don't want to get too nationalistic, but they don't want to tie it entirely leave out nationalism. But then in the Republican Party, you have this embracing of uh, nationalism as almost a, a secular type of religion. Um, what is often called uh, civic religion uh, in mid 20th century lingo. There's this nationalism uh, of culture, which of course can move in that reactionary populism kind of way and move into fundamentalism. And then uh, counterposed to popular culture or resistance through cultural creation. Okay, so mass, and then we have popular culture. Notice that popular culture now is on the level of proletarian culture, that popular culture is, um, is really what is rooted in the actual people uh, of the lower classes in this bourgeois conception of, of class structure. So I think maybe what I am just understanding here, uh, he wants to make a distinction between um, uh, popular culture, which he wants to seize upon as productive, creative culture, which then gives us those out of the box ideas to move the revolutionary revolution forward. But opposed to that is national culture and mass culture, which might be confused. These three might be confused, uh, D, E, and G. Um, they're often kind of, it's hard to tell the difference. And mass culture, I think what I'm understanding uh, <clears throat> is alienated culture. This is the kind of culture that tends to, in the words of Sheldon Wolden, um, a political philosopher who died recently, uh, talks about incorporating individuals, uh, incorporating movements and, and subcultures into the bourgeois, um, larger uh, capitalist sort of way of thinking. Mass culture, and I see, and this is traditionally, when we say, talk about mass culture, we're talking about like newspapers, television, radio, um, these broadcast sort of phenomena that we saw in the early 20th century really proliferate, including Hollywood films and things like that, it tends to, <clears throat> it tends to, uh, it does alienate, uh, or, or, or the people within that are alienated from this multiculturalism, uh, as, as I was saying before, uh, but the mass culture produced by NBC and ABC and Paramount Pictures and Blizzard or you know uh, World of Warcraft, uh, all these kind of cultural products that come from these transnational corporations, um, also kind of tries to fold in people into the bourgeois capitalist production mode of existence, uh, which in this early Marxist way of thinking is an alienated mass, that they're not, they're not, uh, that they're kind of like sleepwalking through life and being used as tools, okay. And of course, uh, Instagram and Facebook would be these new inflections of mass culture, uh, which, don't necessarily fit the old models of broadcast culture, uh, but 
uh, but it's hard to say um, how that how that works out. So, you know, social media is something that would be very interesting to investigate along Ducell's categorization. Okay, uh, and then national culture kind of has its feet in both worlds within the bourgeois culture and the proletarian culture. Because of course, nationalism is often comes out of working class or unemployed uh, sec segments of society, as we saw on January 6th. Uh, but popular culture, he wants to identify as something different. And, and, and he wants to elaborate on this. So let, let's see how he elaborates on that. Okay, evidently this cultural typology and its categorical criteria would presuppose a long and critical epistemological struggle, struggle proper to the new social sciences of Latin America and philosophy of liberation. We had already achieved these distinctions long before, but now they took a more definitive shape. Okay. In 1977, in the third volume of Para Una Etica, de la liberación Latin America towards an ethical ethics of Latin American liberation, we had written imperial culture with universal claims is not the same thing as national culture, which itself is not identical with the popular sector. Okay, so we have, we have uh, imperial, national, and popular as three different categories. Okay, so in 84, he had this all kind of mapped out, but he is already talking in these terms in 1977. Nor is it the same as the enlightened culture of the neo-colonial elite, which is not always bourgeois, but is always oligarchic. Nor is it the same as mass culture, which is alienating and unidimensional in the core as well as in the periphery. Nor is it the same as popular culture. Okay, so popular culture. And we added in 1977, imperial, enlightened, and mass culture within which we can include proletarian culture as a negativity are the imperative internal moments in the dominant totality. And notice that word, word totality, that, that means the systematic totality of imperial uh, cultural domination. However, national culture is still wrong despite its importance. Popular culture is the key moment for cultural liberation. Popular culture is the key moment for liberation. So he sees a lot of value in popular culture, but it's not mass culture. It's not Hollywood and, it, and it's not even like the record industry, uh, but something that's more rooted in authentic, the authentic experience of uh, the revolutionary class, which is, you know, he's using the proletariat as a proxy for that um, in this context. In the 1980s, with the active presence of the FSLN in Nicaragua and many other, as the Sandinistas, and many other uh, events in Latin America, creative cultural culture was conceived of as popular revolutionary culture. Latin American popular culture, we wrote in 1984, uh, in the 1984 article mentioned, can only be elucidated, decanted, and authenticated in the process of liberation, economically from capitalism, politically from oppression, establishing a new democratic type, thereby representing cultural liberation taking a creative step along the path of the historical cultural tradition of the oppressed, the current revolutionary uh, protagonists. So taking a creative step along the path, let me grab this here, taking a creative step along the path of the historical cultural tradition of the oppressed, and here the oppressed now is the current revolutionary protagonist. The oppressed are the protagonist of history in this world historic Hegelian sense, but inflected through Marxism, which is more um, 
concrete and scientific and actually historical, not so ideological. In that era, one spoke of the historical subject of revolutionary culture, the people, uh, Pueblo, as the social block of the oppressed, when it recovered the subjective consciousness of its historical revolutionary function. Okay, so here we see him raise the issue of this historical subject. Is the people rooted in popular culture creating out of this deep spiritual root uh, a kind of self-consciousness? Is that class becoming the revolutionary class as opposed to Marx and Engels proletarian? This notion of popular culture was not populist Populist indicated the inclusion within national culture of the bourgeois and oligarchic culture of the elite, as well as the culture of the proletariat, of the campesino, of all the inhabitants of the soil organized under a state designated Bonapartism in, in France. Uh, the popular, on the other hand, so uh, populist is a way of thinking uh, of, of just the general population with all its subsegments kind of grouped together as a political unit that then can be administered from a centralized bourgeois liberal state uh, in a centralized Bonapartian sort of way, as I've discussed earlier. The popular, on the other hand, is an entire social sector of the nation insofar as they were exploited or oppressed but who moreover retain a certain exteriority. Okay, so now this is gonna be really key to his analysis, this idea of exteriority. They retain a certain exteriority as we will see later. This sector is oppressed in the state system, but maintains its alterity. An alter means other, like if the ego, and so these are often words that are used in conjunction here, Ego is like the ego, ego cogito of Cartesianism. Remember that this overall text that we're looking at is the anti-Cartesian meditations. Um, but this lingo of ego and alter. So there's ego is I and alter is the other. Um, and so if I think of like, if I'm having a conversation with my wife, I'm the ego and she's the alter. She's the other that I'm coming in communication with, uh, sometimes called an I-thou relationship. Um, but then alterity can take on more, um, more philosophical thinking and categories like with Hegel where mind body was in this was in this life and death struggle because they were entirely cut off from one another and could not conceive of one another and that alterity is is the kind of alterity that Dussel is is uh, appealing to here is that Latin American culture and and the Puebla the people uh, rooted in popular culture uh, uh, are all are alter are other in that they're totally ignored and disregarded by bourgeois um, elites at the center of empire and even oligarchic elites on the periphery of empire. Uh, this sector is oppressed in the state system but maintains its alterity, difference, and freedom in those cultural moments scorned by the oppressor, like folklore, music, food, dress, and festivals, the memory of their heroes, their emancipation, uh, emancipatory moments, their social and political organizations, etc. Um, so certain cultural moments are looked down upon, like, you know, certain forms of music or certain forms of dress you know, the oligarchic elite uh, 
in, in a Latin American culture will dress like Europeans. They're not gonna dress like uh, peasants. And um, so they're gonna look down on those who do. But in being excluded, the people are free to express themselves in their own way and not be dominated by Eurocentric culture. Uh, they don't have to eat, uh, you know, caviar and foie gras. They, they can eat tacos, right? It's like just good food. <laughs> um, where the oligarchic elites don't have that kind of freedom. As one can see, the monolithic substantialist conception of a single Latin American culture had been left behind, and the internal cultural fissures grew thanks to that very same cultural revolution. Okay. Um, so exteriority and alterity, and we've seen him use this alterity uh, lingo a little bit before. All right, so I'm going to stop this here.